Well, I'm uh, very glad to meet you. I don't mind being on the video. Because <laughs> Honda can't fire my ass, can they? <laughs> That's okay, they can't fire yours either. So uh, we're all in the same boat here. Um, anyways, I'm glad to meet with you. Uh, thanks for coming along to the meeting. Uh, John asked me to come and just kind of give a bit of an economic uh, presentation. He, he introduced me as a senior economist at the CAW. I'm actually the only economist <laughs> at the CAW, which made it easy to get to the top of the hierarchy. Uh, the only problem is I've got no junior economists uh, to do my bidding, but um, my role at the union is to do some of the number crunching that goes on if we're in bargaining with a company, whether it's in the auto sector or any of the other sectors where we represent uh, members, then I uh, get given the financial statements, some of the economic data, some of the facts and figures, and then we try and crunch it through to come up with arguments that support our case in the bargaining. Part of my job and our overall research department at the union is also to develop position papers from the union on all of the different factors that are affecting uh, workers uh, in Canada, whether that's uh, budgets, government budgets and taxes, uh, whether that's uh, international trade issues, uh, such as some of the free trade agreements that the government's negotiating, I'll talk about a bit today. Uh, whether it's about the policy that the government adopts around the auto industry or the aerospace industry or any of the other high-tech sectors of our economy. So we're always out there as a union. We're both fighting at the bargaining table to represent and protect our members in each particular workplace. But we're also fighting in kind of the broader arena, if you like. The newspapers, the political debates, the policy think tanks to put forward a set of ideas and proposals that would allow working people to have a bit more security, a bit more uh, prosperity. And that's what I want to cover in my presentation uh, today. Uh, of course, you've had some discussions at the plant here about wages and labor costs. Uh, the company has been trying to freeze, uh, freeze your wages, uh, or even in some, in, in some cases uh, cut them back. They're bringing in more of the uh, temporary workforce, the permanent temporary workforce, uh, working at lower wages. They're always making the case that uh, wages are too high, that labor costs have to get cut back. And uh, this, uh, I think, is an absolute misstatement of the challenges facing not just Honda, but facing the whole auto industry, which uh, we'll argue have absolutely nothing to do with uh, wages and labor costs. Uh, in fact, uh, because of the productivity of average auto workers uh, in Canada, uh, we actually get paid relatively little compared to the value uh, of what we produce. And uh, I'll put forward a few uh, facts and figures uh, on that score. So this is called busting uh, the myths. And uh, just want to cover some of those arguments uh, in terms of where uh, Canada's auto industry is going. The assumption that's made out there by company executives, by um, business commentators, by some of the politicians, uh, is that there's a race to the bottom going on out there. That there's always somewhere, someone somewhere else in the world who's willing to work for less than you so you, and you, better cut your pay, tighten your belt, and accept less, uh, otherwise you'll lose uh, your job. And the only way that we can ever hope to get a company like Honda to come to Canada, set up a plant, operate that plant, and stay here with the jobs that are associated with that plant, is to bribe them with an enormous carrot, okay? A carrot that gets bigger all the time in terms of uh, low wage costs, high productivity, tax cuts uh, for the company, uh, government uh, incentives to help them make uh, their investment. Like when Honda built the engine plant here, they got a government incentive uh, to help cover some of the costs. And our view is that we shouldn't have to be in the position of constantly trying to bribe a company to come to Canada, that because of the fact that we are a country with a large population, with a large vehicle market, Canadians, remember, buy about 1.6 million new vehicles a year worth over $50 billion a year. So that's a nice pie, you know, for these automakers to come after to try and sell their product. If we're gonna make that pie available to them and allow them to sell their products here uh, and make good money off of that, they owe something back to the community in terms of what they're prepared to invest and produce here. Uh, and that's the assumption that we want to uh, rethink. Um, and in so doing, we're challenging the myths that are out there from the companies, from the politicians, from the commentators. The argument, I'm sure you've heard it, that Canadian auto wages are too high. Uh, some people say even the highest auto wages uh, in the world, which is nonsense, but the claim is out there. And it's like they say, if you repeat something often enough, people start to believe it. So you've no doubt heard that your wages at Honda, Alliston, are too high compared to what Honda pays uh, elsewhere, even in the US. Uh, those high wages, they say, are the source of everything that's gone wrong uh, in the auto industry. It's kind of like, uh, a knee-jerk reflex, you know, you go to see the doctor, something's wrong, <coughs> what's wrong? Blame the workers, wages are too high. 
doesn't matter exactly what it is, but the reflex argument uh, is there, uh, and that's what they uh, suggest. The argument is made that when the auto industry went into crisis, especially in uh, North America, the three North American producers in 2009 with the financial crisis, you know that there was some renegotiation of the contracts at that time, including our contracts in Canada. And the argument is made that because of that, that's why the Detroit Three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler are all making money today, but they were losing money before. The myth is that that was solely because of the cuts uh, in wages that occurred. The final myth is that if you cut your wage or freeze it and do away with some of your bonus payments, that's the only way that you'll save jobs uh, in Canada. And uh, those are the myths that are out there. Every one of those claims is wrong. If we actually look at the statistical reality, in real terms, Canadian wages are not the highest in the world. In fact, relative to the prices that we pay for the stuff that we buy here in Canada, our wages are lower than the wages in the US and in several other auto-producing countries around the world, including Germany and including Japan. So the argument that our wages are the highest in the world is nonsense. It's all about the value of the Canadian dollar, not the value of our actual wage that we're paid and that we use to buy uh, consumer goods for ourselves and our families. Uh, and I'll explain uh, what that means. The reason the auto companies have lost money in some years, although I will point out, Honda has not lost money in a single year not with the global financial crisis, not with the recession, not even with the uh, tsunami and the floods in Thailand, okay? All of that downtime, the company still made money throughout it, uh, which is astounding when you think about it. Uh, for a company to experience the recession, the financial crisis, natural disaster, and still report positive profits year after year is very unusual. Most companies would have recorded losses in some of those years, but not Honda. They made money every uh, single year. Uh, to the extent that their financial performance has been crunched though, it obviously has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with the work that you perform, the productivity of your labor, and the wages and compensation uh, that you receive. The company's problems are due to financial and natural disasters that are completely beyond your control. So why are they making you pay for it? Same goes for our members uh, in the unionized auto companies. The crisis in those companies was a result of a global financial crisis, a recession, a collapse in sales, and in many cases, lousy management by the companies that we work for. But guess what? None of those things are in our control. We just go in, put in a day's work, and get a day's pay for it. We aren't investors in the sense of, you know, I'm going to take a chance, I'm going to risk, I'm going to bet some money on the company. I might win, I might lose. That's not what going to work is about. Going to work is about going to uh, exert your energy, your brains and your brawn to produce a useful product and you can get paid for that in the same way as any other supplier to the company gets paid for what they provide to the company without uh, being expected to take a cut if the company's profits weren't positive. In terms of the 2009 crisis in North America, we never did cut our wages. That's the advantage of having a union. Even when the shit hits the fan, if I can use a technical term, Okay, that's a technical term in economics. It means asset portfolio considerably underperformed analyst expectations. Okay, the shit hit the fan for short. The shit hit the fan in 2009. The companies, two of them were on the verge of bankruptcy. Again, not because of the workers, but because of the collapse in auto sales. All of the changes in the contracts that were negotiated, the ones that we did in Canada was we gave up a couple bonuses. We um, reduced uh, some of the paid time off uh, that we get and uh, change some of the work rules, that worked out to savings of about $250 per vehicle maximum. Not enough to make any significant difference uh, to the future of the company. The only reason we did it was the government said, go and do this, or we're not going to support the companies, they're going to collapse and you're going to be out of work. Okay, so in that case, okay, we'll go and we'll negotiate the least painful way to make some adjustments for our members, and uh, it made a tiny contribution. What's actually happened since 2009, the companies are earning way more per vehicle. They're taking in $5,000 more per vehicle in net pricing. That's after you pay off the sales incentives and everything else that they use to get the vehicles moving. So their net unit revenue has gone up by 5,000 per vehicle. That's the reason they're making money today. Partly because the product is better, partly because the economy is recovering, partly because the currency rates have changed, including the yen, okay, which is much, much higher. So the cost to Honda and Toyota and the others of bringing product into North America has become a lot higher. So it means for, for vehicles that are made within North America, like the ones that you make, uh, the pricing room on them 
uh, is much uh, better. So to the extent that the industry in North America is doing better, it has nothing to do with wage cuts, everything to do with uh, economic recovery and stronger uh, pricing. The final reality, and this is what we always have to remember, they're always telling us if you cut your wage, you'll make your job more secure. Doesn't matter how much we cut our wages, union or non-union, the reality is they can always find somewhere else where the people are more desperate, where they're hungry, where they're, where they're uh, hopeless, and where they're willing to work for next to nothing. And the idea that we should have to compete with that, okay, that Canadian middle class families should have to look at Mexico, China, and Thailand Three places where Honda does business, where all in labor costs per hour, including wages, benefits, pensions, and government taxes, are all well under five dollars per hour. Okay, is just uh, offensive. We remember, as I said at the beginning, in Canada we buy 1.6 million vehicles a year, worth over 50 billion dollars a year. That, as a national opportunity for companies like Honda to make good money, and we have the right as Canadians and as working people to deserve a fair share, to deserve and to demand a fair share of the prosperity that comes from the vehicles that we buy. Remember, it comes from the vehicles that we buy. And that's kind of the philosophical uh, position that we take when we say we shouldn't have to join a race to the bottom. A, we can never win a race to the bottom. We can never cut our costs to try and compete with low-wage producers. Uh, and B, we shouldn't uh, have to do 